Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hello, I'm... Insert your name. And you're listening to... Insert name of show. And now I'd just like to say... Insert funny ad-libbed comment. Well, welcome to Otaku Generation. generation. Next generation radio for otaku. <laughs> Our podcast brings all the otaku to the yard. I have this great idea. We should form a club that seeks out other podcasts and then collaborates with them, right? Oh, no, wait. Let's just destroy them all. We're still podcasting from OGNetworks.tv in a basement where destroying your podcast is not allowed. We're doing fine killing our own. Show number 677, May 30th, 2018, with this week's topic, Haruhi Suzumiya. And now, other podcasts we probably shouldn't produce. Number one, The Melancholy of Otaku Generation. Number two, Attack of Otaku Generation. Number three, Mobile Suit Otaku Generation. Number four, OG48 Idol Academy. And number five, Fist of the OG. And now, someone no one needs or wants to see dance, Alan Chase. Fist of, oh, I, you know, my, my brain went in the wrong place. You are already downloaded. <laughs> yeah. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Alan. I'm Matt. I suspect that's not the place he was thinking. Catch up, Bryce. <laughs> and Paul. We do have a Paul, and uh, we, we could hear him. We have a full uh, house. We do have a full house. That, that's good. I uh, <laughs> We're ever presently having uh, technical problems with Mike's dying. I don't know. Look, we're, we're, uh, we've are we're been around for a while. So no matter how many spares I buy, they, they seem to die off. And uh, I went on to some backup spares. It, it sounds a lot better. Mm. <laughs> and Mike's a- cannot withstand stand my mellifluity uh yeah so uh anyhow. oh you're not talking into these microphones are you they're not designed for that what's freesh what's bang what's squeak with the og crew indeed uh maybe we don't want to know what squeak with everyone so anyhow um so what did i do uh it's memorial day weekend so i got an extra day we are actually not recording on sunday we're recording on monday <clears throat> one day so yesterday we recorded for or two days ago for the rest yeah who, who cares um <laughs> So I finally watched Black Panther. I finally saw it. It It's good. Okay. Enjoyed that. And then uh, caught up on some TV and I did a lot of programming. Mm, Okay. For some uh, side project that I'm I'm working on. That's it. I think that's the most magical thing I did. Put some Spotify on and got an opportunity to uh, program when I I never have that chance. So, uh, yeah, so that was it. That was all that's what's what's new with me. Nothing, uh, Nothing additional outside of that. Matt, what about you? What's been going on? Um, well, I had a get together over Memorial Day. Some people showed up. We uh, cooked some sausages on the grill, hung out, played some games. One of the interesting things we talked about was sort of the the like huge raft of superhero movies that have been coming out for the last ten years. And one of my friends had this kind of interesting viewpoint, which was that he didn't want to see superhero movies that were about superheroes he'd already seen lots of movies about. Like he's seen a bajillion Superman movies. He's seen a bajillion um, Batman movies. And he's just frankly, right. you know, had tired had, of it, tired of those ones or the reboots of the consistent, you know, things. Right? Yeah. Just yeah. like redoing the same superhero origin story over well, and over again. I think, would you say though, like reboots are more of a modern incarnation? Well, there are certain like evergreen characters that have just been like redone decade after decade. I mean, if you look back at Batman, there have been Batman movies since, like, the adventure serials in the 1950s. Sure, right. Okay, so they had the TV series, but then they did the movies, and so mm-hmm. they, it isn't so much they've been rebooting 
them as they've been continuing the franchise with different actors uh, doing, you know, well, you can, variations you of You can of consider Batman. that that every different incarnation is its own reboot because they, they very pointedly do not pay any attention to the continuity of, of you know, previous previous, previous well, TV shows, movie serials, Would you say whatever. that's the case for James Bond? Uh well, James Bond is just a singular character. Right, okay. Whereas superheroes are just sort of like a member of a shared universe. Right, okay. I was just, I was putting forward the same idea that mm-hmm. they were just, even though there were some obvious visual changes and some storyline changes, very much they was the same character just going forward with, you know, in a different format Yeah, each basically time. like every time they, <laughs> they change actors on James Bond, I feel like they are sort of like just rebooting the character mm. because the whole idea is not that it's the same James Bond because if that was the case then James Bond ought to be like 90 years old or something right, like yeah, that yeah. or dead. Every time you restart with a new character it's sort of like well this is the newest incarnation mm-hmm. of James Bond for the contemporary movie going audience. you know with Superman we had Christopher Reed mm-hmm. and and so it stayed pretty much that way in the platform for the movie until they got to a point where they had to change it but you know they've added stuff into the Superman universe only I guess when they went with with uh, the guy who was in the Justice League, whoever the new Superman is, I guess they kind of rebooted it at that point. Uh-huh. They haven't really messed with Superman too much, though, but to the point, I would also get tired of seeing the same like same character a lot, right? There's more to explore in the universe. Yeah, so I kind of understand the, the point of view on that. Well, the source material comics are constantly rebooting the heroes. I mean, that's been going on. Yeah, the like every yeah. once in a while right. they do something like, what is it, Infinity War... Or like the new Fifty Two didn't DC do that? Secret to Wars, that was it. Yeah, but yeah, but there's something where they're just like, well, either we've we're like collapsing under the weight of our own continuity, right, yeah. or <laughs> we just want to make a clean break and start start over again, so we can yeah. make the character more appropriate for for the modern age. Yeah, or did that person suggest? some of the superheroes he would like to see or uh we we were kind of like ranging all over the place but he just specifically was was like tired of of like for example batman movies what about the avengers because they're not they're not those the avenger the modern my avenger movies are they're not reboots each they're sequels to each other is yeah. he tired of seeing like the same heroes in the same movies even if it's not a full-on reboot or is it um certain ones he was he was interested in but other ones he he his problem with the Marvel movies was that he's not a big fan of superheroes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And unless you've seen, like, every Marvel movie, mm-hmm. then when you see, like, you know, Avengers uh, 3, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Yeah. Like, you can't go into some of these, like, you know, ensemble team-up movies cold and really expect to get a yeah. full enjoyment out of them. If you've seen, like, Iron Man and Captain America and you know, at least one yeah. Thor movie... Mm-hmm. Then you understand what the Avengers are about. But if you haven't like been prepped with these solo movies, it, it really cuts your enjoyment of the movie down. It's like, well, the spectacle's just as good, but yeah. you know, it, it lacks significance because they don't have time in the team up movies to, to give you that that setup and identification and, right. and development of all the characters. Plastic man. Well, I will say <laughs> for Justice League, I was happy to see Jason Momoa as Aqua Man, and uh, he made him look pretty badass. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, people are. <laughs> I remember the cartoon. You're just like Aqua Man, right? <laughs> but uh, he made him look pretty badass but as an individual you know i mean i'm I, before game of thrones i was set up with that guy as being a badass in atlantis as she won mm-hmm. or as she atlantis target atlantis so so i don't know i thought he he wore that pretty well and i hope to see some future stuff for him playing that character as long as we don't get a wonder twins movie <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I don't know enough about it other than Wonder Twins activate and have heard the sound sample a bazillion times. They were just sort of like lame teenage hangalongs for the right. Super Friends. Form yeah. of war. Well, yeah, you, I don't know. Basically, they, they started out with Wendy, Marvin, and their dog, Wonder Mutt. Mm-hmm. At some point, the Super Friends show went on hiatus for a couple of years. And when they came back, they were like, well, people didn't seem to like Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog too much. Let's let's replace them. Let's get rid of them and replace them with like some teenagers who have superpowers. And it's like, well, that might be an interesting idea, except for them having the lamest set of Wonder Twin powers in the universe. <laughs> They're no Apache chief, that's for sure. 
Yeah. Wait, does Mutt change into anything or not? Well, the Wonder Twins had a... Uh, one had was a... War, one was Amel's, but what was the dog's power? He had no power. Oh. Wendy and Marvin had no powers. They replaced him with a space monkey. Right. Did a monkey have powers? <laughs> it was a space monkey. It was a monkey from space. Well, I guess that's good something. enough. Not for me, well, though. You know what's going to come next. They're going to reboot. Not reboot. They're going to make a live-action Teen Titans or something like that. I thought they had, like, that's a, not, like, a TV show on, like, the air, but I thought there was supposed to be now, like, a DC pay thing, something similar to how CBS and, like, every oh, network has to now have their own, their their own streaming site. Yeah, so there's now, like, a superhero streaming thing. I Mm-hmm. Where there's yeah. like a bunch of like net exclusive superhero quote TV unquote shows mm-hmm. that you can watch. There's something on YouTube that I just caught like news about it. So yeah. I think Teen Titans Go is gonna have a movie this summer, like animated movie. Yeah, so, which is right. probably for the better. I keep them animated. I don't think we need a live action Teen Titans <laughs> no, right now. I, I don't in our lives. <laughs> I the original Teen Titans cartoon was pretty decent. No, yeah, well, I've seen that with the cartoon. It's just, I don't know if I want a live action. <laughs> like, or Teen Titans Go is very different from right, the original yeah. Teen Titans. Yeah, it's it's. It falls into my mind as as one of those things that is trying to like mimic like wacky anime stuff. It like with just the whole car- chibi cartoon style yeah. of of character design, and then you have everything is just like ridiculous over the top gag comedy. Yeah, and talking about horrible cartoon bastardizations of mm-hmm. kind of serious franchises. There's Watchmen also, babies. No, no. There's actually a. Um, <laughs> Thundercats Roar, which is essentially just... Oh, I heard about I... this. It's some sort of bastardization yeah. of Thundercats <laughs> where it's just like... Uh, like it's targeted at five-year-olds or something because it's that cartoony and simplistic. I think they are. It reminds um, me of like Steven Universe's art style in a little way. Yeah, something like pictures, that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I never. I'm, I don't know anything about Steven Universe honestly, so I couldn't tell you. I could swear I feel like they're making a Muppet Babies reboot. <laughs> Live action or with actual puppets? No, no not three D CG CGI <laughs> motion no, capture. No uh, animated. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Andy Circus will play Kermit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, be kind of cool. Yeah, back on board. Yeah. <laughs> not, not as Kermit, but baby Kermit. It's, a, it's critical that we make a distinction. <laughs> All right, before we, we get too far down the line, uh, anything else, Matt? Uh, let's see. Well, one of the other fun conversations we had was one of the guys um, who showed up is, is a chemistry major, and he just had all sorts of fun stories about, you know, horrible fatal things that idiots have done to themselves with uh, chemistry or just accidental carelessness. Mm -hmm. You know, fun little things like, oh, yeah, sure you say you cleaned up the lab area just right, splashes acetone on the desk, it turns, like, purple. And they're like, yeah, if you'd touch that, you'd have poisoned yourself. Lab safety is important. Yes. I work in the Uh, lab every day. (laughs) (laughs) He does. Yes. uh, So if you don't know anything about chemistry, do not fuck around with it, seriously. Yeah. But aside from that, haven't had a chance to see Solo, a Star Wars story yet. Um, planning on seeing it. I'm, I'm not sure if I should be like expecting a bad movie because of all like the negative pre-hype that I've heard from fanboys, or if it's going to be wonderful and the hype is all just like typical fanboy exaggeration, or if it's going to fall somewhere in the middle and be an okay movie. Yeah, I, I generally don't take. Um... I take that all with a grain of salt. The only kind of maybe exception of something that I hadn't bothered watching at all mm. is, you know, Batman versus Superman. And I just thought, there's something not right about this. This just seems like, you know, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching production. Well, I- I'm not well vested into the comic franchise, you know, like having read it as a comic. So to me... Yeah. It's so not important that I have to watch it. And then I heard nothing but a lot of negativity from it. So that just reinforces the thing I was not going to do anyways. Yeah. So I won't pay for it. You know, if it happens to be on TV and okay, maybe and I'm super bored and I don't have something to do, which is unlikely, I might watch it. But, you know, the reality of it is most of the time, People are are in the business of whining because it's fun, not because they have anything substantial to actually say about the thing. Well, fanboy outrage is is entertaining. It's fun to stir it up, and it's fun to participate. Stirring the shit or participating in it, it's really annoying. I I still think I would like to see these side stories, right? So uh, I'm interested. You know, we're all going to have that moment where, well, that's not Harrison Ford, right? We're all going to have that moment. You know, does that actor hold up? But it's a much younger, different version of it. And the question will always be, our expectation is for them to, 
have a certain kind of wit and a certain kind of timing, and it's a completely different person. So I think the likelihood is is not. I expect to be slightly out of alignment with my expectations. So that's a thing. We should probably go see it. <laughs> yeah, we probably should. Yeah. Okay. Um, Botas, what about you? What, what's your uh, what's the movie of the week? Before I get to that, yeah. I haven't seen Solo yet, but I've seen a few reviews, like not like fanboy reviews, but just general reviews. Yeah, like, sort of like mainstream film reviewers. Yeah, the proper reviews. Mm-hmm. Or proper like in quotes. But the point <laughs> being that <laughs> the sense that I get is that it's okay it's not like it's not you have tempered expectations then it'll, yeah. it's enjoyable enough it's not like going to blow their socks off type of a deal but it's like a fine okay it's entertaining also, type film these side it's films what, are okay. not getting the same kind of budget as like the big the big feature ones right so i wouldn't expect it to be you know the best special effects the best puppeteering the best biggest epic thing either so. There's also things just like story and how mm-hmm. it fits in and sure. all that stuff, you know. Yeah. So as long as you're not like expecting it to be the best Star Wars ever, and I think they enjoy it, just not being uh, well. Nothing <laughs> could ever top the original Star Wars in my heart. The one with Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> <laughs> episode one the original yeah. shoot that man <laughs> the the look that you guys couldn't see that I didn't capture <laughs> you have a camera <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's fleeting it's gone okay so the movie of the week is I have some debate about whether or not I wanted to bring it up because I saw it through unofficial means you know what that means but it's The Big Bad Fox and Other Tales. Mm-hmm. Now, G-Kids has the right to it, rights to it, but it's they've been kind of sitting on it. Like, I was expecting it to at least be in, like, theaters for, like, a very brief amount of time or something. But anyway, this is an animated children's film, and sometimes I say, like, I specify between family or children's film, but this time I'm being pretty clear that's more for a children's type audience. Okay. But that being said, it's done by a French animation studio, done by the same people that did... Ernest and Celestine. Celestine. It's got slightly interesting, like, visual style. Like, it tries to look like the children's book that it's made out of. Mm -hmm. It's actually an anthology of three stories. One of the more disappointing aspects of it is that the Big Bad Fox story is just one third of it, and the fox doesn't play a role in the other two (laughs) stories. Okay. Although I say it's a children's film, I did get some enjoyment out of it, and it's got very cartoony type animation action whatnot stuff it's not like like super oh my god swell type animation but it's nicely animated and again it's got a nice illustrated book style to it it's i saw it with subtitles that's one of the issues though is hopefully if g kids actually gets around to properly releasing it it'll have an english dub or if you have a family that speaks french then Unless you've got a family with young children, which is the other thing. It's not just children, but young children. And I have my doubts about who this would appeal to. But at the same time, and it's not like the animation is anything spectacular. So it's not something I could say, like, if you're a big animation buff, and then check out as well. But I did get some enjoyment. It's got some sarcastic and dark humory type moments with the story. And it's just cute, light, fluffy, mm-hmm. animated fun sometimes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, okay. there's a place for that stuff. Yeah, that's it for me. I mean, we're very kind of late. Um, okay, so I guess Paul's probably going to cover a couple of anime he's been watching from the new season still. So I'll start with, um, well, I, I'm, I think I'm at the very end of God of War, and um, I, was, I was, was late coming over here because I was stuck in, like, I can't, where am I going to be able to save? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I finally got to a save point, and it's funny, it, like, there was this big, like, kind of big boss battle at the end, and I realized, like, unlike the previous God of Wars, my favorite moments of combat in this game actually aren't against the bosses. Like, mm-hmm. it's much more fun taking on, like, groups of enemies and juggling them and comboing them into each other, and a lot of the moves they give you work really well against crowds of enemies, but, like, don't really work on boss characters. You know, you can freeze the enemies, or you can smack them in the air and juggle them, but you can't do that to the bosses. Some of them are huge, well, and they don't... <laughs> that's doesn't make why any they're sense. bosses, yeah. you know? Right, but... It's kind of funny, like, it's a big change from, like, I look back at the original God of Wars, like, those bosses were humongous, they're big spectacles, they're fun, they're epic battles, and, like, that's what I remember from those games. But this one, it's an interesting change. I still really like it, I think it's a really great game, but it's not, it's, it's weird, it, like, it changed a lot of things about God of War in a lot of ways, um, mostly for better, I think, probably all for better <laughs> at this point, I'm going through it. Uh, so I'll recommend that still, if you have PS4, I mean... If you have PS4, you should probably get this game. Cool. Um, I watched. Well, I watched more uh, Space Battleship Tiramisu. Oh yeah, I haven't checked out any of that. <laughs> one. Yeah, that's what do you a, think? It's funny. Um, there's some really funny moments in it. Uh, they're very. 
the, so each episode's like seven or eight minutes long, and then there, it's kind of divided into like basically two halves, like with two basically two punchlines at the end of each half. So the jokes kind of come like in sort of four minute bursts as sort of end, and they're mostly pretty funny so far. I'm like a episode five now, and there's sort of actually like ten jokes, I guess I would say. Uh, it's good. He, one he found like he wants to keep this space chihuahua. He found <laughs> a box floating in space, and but like the commander, they finally interest the commander of this whole thing, this whole you know battleship that he's part of. And he's like, no, you can't keep that thing. It will grow super fast once it's exposed to oxygen. He's like, no, he's gonna like hide in his cockpit. But of course, it grows super fast as he warned him. <laughs> so he has to like then go out back out of space and like leave the dog and the giant dog in a box. This is chihuahua. This is where he found it, and he's sort of flying away. And the dog makes this really great like blah, 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 blah. instead of a bark. And just, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty good. So that's like, I must say, it's it's not as funny as like a Sakamoto, but it's. They're quick, and I think that if you get like one that doesn't really fall kind of that falls kind of flat, you're going to get something pretty quickly turn around. So it's funny. I think it's you're looking for like a goofy, fun, short thing. I think it's the best of the season for that style for sure. Uh, and I guess I've, I've been reading a comic called Low, which is an image published comic hmm. um, that's about I guess the Earth. Um, the sun has sort of expanded rapid more rapidly than anticipated at one point, so they had to basically go underwater humanity <laughs> and sort of build set up shop there to. It, you know, take care of the ra- or to dodge the radiation, and I guess the, it's about they've sent all these probes out in the space though to sort of find habitable planets that eventually we can move to, but none years go by and none come back with anything conclusive. Mm-hmm. And basically, oxygen is kind of running out in the underwater city, like it's kind of being to the point where like it's being filtered so many times, it's not really high quality anymore, and people are eventually it's going to just people are just going to die <laughs> from lack of oxygen. And so, but a probe comes back finally with a positive match, and there's one like sort of. Uh, the wife of a she's a scientist. There's his dad. Her, or, I'm sorry. His uh, hu- her husband <laughs> is like a helmsman who's like he controls like this big. It's, it's, it's complicated. I'm not going to too deep. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is that you know she decides like, we're going to go. She wants to go up and find this probe. But at this point, like the Senate has become like these like like whatever man like he's doing drugs. <laughs> like we're all dead in like three months. <laughs> like we're just gonna <laughs> you know let's all like just have orgies and literally that's kind of uh, what they're doing sometimes. And so she's like, well, forget it. And he's like, well, <laughs> the counselor's like, look, if you want to go, go. <laughs> we're not gonna fund it. You can take a take your sub and go do it. And so it's kind of that story of her making her way to the surface, along with like some other like you know there's pirates and other creatures that have sort of become sentient on on the surface of the plant through the radiation. So it's cool. Uh, has a cool art style. That's probably my favorite part. If you want to like flip through one of the books. Okay. It's kind of like yeah, a cool like, little walk. I'm on three, volume three. This is volume two. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It has kind of a cool look to it. Um, I like that the, uh, this is almost like a, not watercolor look, but it's something about, I don't know how to best describe it, but it has, it's very colorful and I appreciate that for sure. Uh, it can be a little violent uh, at times as most image comics tend to be, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I check it out. It's, it's cool. It's got a great look to it, and I'm definitely in for the story. Let's see where this all goes, because she has finally like made it to the surface, but now it's like, what do we do with this? I don't even know what the probe's even going to say when she gets to it. Uh, poor giant insect person thing. <laughs> if that's who I think it is, you know, he might have had a, gr- <laughs> had a grum on it. <laughs> uh, anyway, I guess that's it for me. Uh, okay, I don't want to take too long, so I'm sure. Oh, and uh, also, new fanboy yep, forecast yep, new fanboy came forecast. out on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So I am continuing to stay up to date with this season's anime, but a couple of other things. Uh, I did pick up a copy of the first volume of the published version of Homestuck, which many anime fans may either be also fans of or loathe completely <laughs> due to its fandom, uh, which has <laughs> been sort of infesting conventions for quite a number of years. Uh, it's so a pretty it's, thick book. It, this is a pretty thick book, and this is only the first volume. I have mm. no idea how many volumes there will be, will be because this thing is a a massive uh, sort of series. Uh, this only this this mm-hmm. covers acts one and two, but the acts get progressively longer, and so I think the last act is act is like longer than everything that came before it. So uh. Uh, I have not read the whole thing. I've read maybe fifty percent, so I'm not all the way sunk into sort of the the mythology. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, once you get past sort of the initial hurdles, and it is not a friendly comic to get into by any means, Mm. uh, it started off as sort of a forum game. So the the author was posting, you know, pictures, uh, uh, the comics on a forum, but then users would suggest action, sort of like an adventure game, and he would animate the next panel. That sort of faded away as it went on. Mm. So anyway, uh, it's a nicely put together volume. Mm. Uh, Viz has done a nice job with it. I hold through it. Yeah, yeah. And what else? Oh, I guess I watched uh, a DVD, uh, Atomic Blonde, finally. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I've uh, been meaning 
to I, I saw that was on HBO or something to watch. Yeah, so I think the DVD came out at the end of last year. It's a very solid action movie. Hmm. Okay. Um, it's uh, de- definitely uh, very visceral, kinesthetic. Got a uh, uh, a strong sort of '80s art style going for it. Uh, it's not, I think, perfectly realized in that respect, but the grittiness comes through for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, Charlize Theron does a superb job with the action scenes, which are sort of the reason you go to that, not for the rather tortured and unnecessarily convoluted plot. Okay, so I I will take it off my list then. <laughs> no, it's it's <laughs> no, but it's it, stellar it, action. I mean, yeah. it, this is stellar action. But mm. it but it has the the typical elements of a spy plot where you're trying to one. Uh, rescue a defector, and then two, there may be a mole in your own organization, although maybe in this case is, well, there's definitely a mole in the organization. Mm. We're just not sure which of our main characters is the mole. Mm. You know, is it the contact? Is it actually our main character who's playing a very deep game? Is her boss corrupt? Et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the last third, they get to a few voiceovers or direct camera addresses mm-hmm. that kind of are a little too much, but nonetheless, I, I don't think they, they weigh it down particularly, as long as you don't go in it's sort of expecting a story, which is not usually what you're going to an action movie for, mm-hmm. or rather, I guess, deep plot. You'd, you'd hope that the story is enough to sort of uh, tie things together, and it does that job, you know, much as the, you know, many people's faces hold up the front of their heads. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So also then on the uh, – oh, I, I guess one last thing to mention is this weekend I took a typewriter repair course, or rather started one. Just oh. completely – Mechanical typewriters? Mechanical typewriters, yes. Not, not even electrics? Not electrics. Oh, no. okay. So and what was your inspiration to, to do this? So my wife found a, uh, a portable Royal Signet typewriter at mm-hmm. an antique store uh, a couple weekends back. And she started searching around, and she's like, hey, this place offers typewriter repair classes, and they're pretty cheap. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that sounds interesting. So it's actually a five-week course. Mm-hmm. I show up for a couple hours on Saturday for five weeks and you know, poke around inside typewriters, so it's kind of fun. Oh, okay. Uh, that reminds me of an interesting story I heard, which was that uh, Tom Hanks is a big fan of collecting typewriters. Hmm. He's, he's an, a typewriter otaku, apparently. And there was some movie that came out in the last couple of years where uh, it was like set in the 70s and he used a typewriter in it. And one of the inducements they, they offered was that's like, hey, Tom, this movie has typewriters in it. <laughs> you, uh, you do with the movie, you can keep the typewriter. <laughs> nice. <laughs> he was like, keep talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so let's see a, a little bit on anime. I watched. Uh, let's see the 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 latest episode of Lupin. Much better than the horrible filler episode. Oh, good. Uh, so it's back to just sort of being you know stylish Lupin stuff. Um, not quite as techno focused as the first arc, uh, but I am definitely enjoying that. Uh, I am not yet up to speed on um, b- 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 Golden Kamui. I watched some of that though. Oh, did you? It's what? good. I yeah. like it a lot. How yeah, far are you? Uh, three episodes in. Okay, but, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's really cool. I'm uh, definitely going to keep watching it. It's good that I saw that it's based off a manga that has like 14 volumes out right now, so they have a lot of stuff to work with with an yeah. anime series, which is okay. always a fear with me with these things that they... <laughs> yeah, start animating too early in the yeah, run. Yeah, and they run out, and then it's like, well, Oops. <laughs> we get either gin up a really bad ending or just say, see you later for two years. <laughs> <laughs> but the issue then is maybe they don't have enough like budgets or That's like true, yeah. seasonal... Like viewership to continue, yeah. so then they yeah. can't really properly finish. The I guess it depends story. how popular it is. I mean, yeah. I think the manga is pretty popular. At least my my girlfriend said, "Oh, I've heard about that a lot." And I was yeah, like, oh, I, "I heard of it before, but it's a really cool idea for a show." We'll keep... uh, the CG bear I thought looked kind of crappy. <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> that's the one thing I'm like, "Oh, about this bear," because like the other animals, like the wolf isn't CG, mm-hmm. so why they just make the bear yeah. CG? It's just a really <laughs> weird choice. Yeah, at least it's not in the frame for too long. No, that's true. So. Yeah. Um, but uh, Megalobox, uh, up to speed on that one. Yeah, that, cool. that is a, a solid show. Good. So the quote politics on quote stuff that's going on the corporates like whatnot stuff is that 
bothersome or not for the yeah that's fine i mean you know it's um i mean once again this is the the, the plot that you get in a show like this shouldn't be the focus mm -hmm. the plot should be there to to pull you into the next conflict and it seems to be doing that job i mean you know as far as a power struggle if you if you think about it too hard it's kind of dumb but uh you know it's it's fine as a motivation to get these people in the in the ring punching each other's faces yeah, I personally don't mind it, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we've now had like two episodes without any actual fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. uh, but I, I think that like the the way they do the characters and the style. Though I have to say that this show's thing is to have people smiling slightly. <laughs> you know, they <laughs> smile <laughs> slightly as they think about punching somebody in the face, or yeah. being cool, or <laughs> you know, putting one over on somebody, or punching somebody in the face. I watched an episode of this too. Oh yeah, that's good. I'll keep watching for yeah. sure. Although you're saying there's not been two episodes without a fight, I'm a little worried. <laughs> Maybe that's not true. No, I, I, I wouldn't but, worry too much. Okay. I mean, there's there's a lot of sort of tension around it. Nonetheless, great scene so. where I, like where the I guess the main character Junk Dog like this punch that the guy's supposed to like take a fall to in the fifth round in the first punch and like his manager has to like go to this like crime lord and guy and be like I'm sorry I'm sorry he's like <laughs> yeah. eh, he's a knife you can apologize with your eye and then uh. I was like oh no don't do this he's like. Eh. Mandra's bold move, though. He made a bold move, and it worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, surprise, Junk Dog is going to Megalobox, or whatever it's <laughs> yeah. called, Megalodon. Or <laughs> no, not yet. He still, still hasn't well, made it I mean, yet. he's going to try. Like, yeah. he's getting, you know, can register now, which, right. I, like, it'd be really weird if the series never got to that point, where it's like, oh, he's going to keep losing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's throwing right. fights the rest of the <laughs> yeah. series. Uh, we'll probably a... just wind up and stew if that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, quite. Um, yeah, and the other ones, uh, Hinamatsuri is, uh, you know, once again, a really odd show in the way it's structuring itself. But, I yeah. wonder if they got the whole, like, false everything, like the main character leaving all that crap that way too many anime do. I wonder if they got that out of the way. Ah, oh, right. Which one is this? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Hinamatsuri. Oh, yeah. uh, this is the uh, psychic girl oh, and the uh, Yakuza crime boss. Because you watched uh, the latest couple. one, correct? Uh, yes, I have. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. I'm really into it. Yeah, I didn't watch that. I know it wasn't here for that preview show. Oh, so yeah. You, you should check out an episode, at it. least an episode of, or two of that. I, I okay. think it's, it's worth it for a sort of light show. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's just been such a, I feel like it, when, even when I was doing the ones I was here for, I was like, I might check out more about this, but then it ended up being like seven shows. And it's like, yeah, yeah it's a lot. It's hard to like, like, you know, the ones I thought were okay kind of started to fall off. And then, you know, I want to stick with like the ones I really liked, but. Maybe catch up later during a bad season. <laughs> um, did Crunchyroll? Oh no, ne never mind. And uh, I guess um, I mean I could talk about everything, but that's probably enough for this week. Mm. I'll sum up some of the the uh, the ones I'm also watching next time. I guess. Okay. So wrap it up there. All right. Um, I guess we'll run a break. Uh, Loot Crate is not here yet, but probably knowing the way the timing works, will will make its way into. In three uh, months from now. Uh, no, probably <laughs> pro probably will show up this week, and uh, we'll be talking about May's loot crate in June. But anyhow, we're going to run a break. We'll be back in just a moment uh, with this week's topic. Hi, I'm Kane from Modern Science, and you're listening to OtakuGeneration.net podcast. And we are back from break with this week's topic, which is... The melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. Yes, a classic, a I would classic. say. A classic. I would say so, right? Because it's got a, what, 2006 on the year? Or just because something so doesn't necessarily make it a classic, though. Well, it's good. Uh, but this was <laughs> this was tremendously popular when it first mm -hmm. came yeah. out. It made Kyoto Animation a mainstream studio almost overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and certainly had its its doppelgangers, right? It had plenty oh, yeah. of people trying to copy. You know, I mean, Just by it? the number of people ripping off Suzumiya these days. Yeah, and then even, um, well, like Lucky Star was ripping off the opening or the closing. And well, Lucky Star was also a parody. Yeah. 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 Right. But, you know, so what is what do we need to know that the rest of the world probably already knows? But let's okay. talk about it. Uh, well, the TV series was produced by Kyoto Animation. It was adapted from original light novels, uh, about 11 volumes, I believe, which have been translated. Yeah, though a couple of them, I think three of them were produced much later, two or three. Mm. Uh, the last ones were produced um, f like five years after the last one, something like that. Yeah, but still it's been many years since the last one's come out, so I think they're pretty much done. The Correct, novels. at 2011, so I guess that's longer than the, the hiatus between them. So, yeah. um, And it's basically a story about... This guy who discovers that the weird girl who sits behind him in school is actually 
a very powerful supernatural being, and she doesn't know it. So let's uh, let's let's get this on the table that the spoiler gloves are off because this is 2006. So if you haven't right. seen it, um, I think I think to discuss a classic show like this at yeah. this late date, we need to dive into it in order to say anything interesting about it. Yeah, I mean it's 12 year old property, so mm -hmm. yeah. So for the rest of you who care about that, you might yeah. the show is over for you now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, depending on what order you watch the episodes, and we'll have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, that that's revealed pretty early on, depending on which. Correct. Way yours. So it's yeah. not, a, like I said, if it's a big spoiler, it's a, just a little spoiler. Who knows? <laughs> right. Right. Um, so this is a this is a show that that likes to take story ideas and just mess around with them. I think um, one of one of the premises of this show is that Haruhi Suzumiya is this very strange girl. Um, they describe her as eccentric, but she she sort of like oscillates between sociopathic slash psychopathic in her disregard for other people and a, a typical anime Genki girl when she's mm -hmm. found something that she's really interested in doing. Right. And half the time she just sort of like marches around doing what she Feels wants like to it. do. Yeah. And then the other half of the time she's found something cool and potentially interesting and she's just gung-ho about let's let's do this and let's have fun with this. And our sort of our viewpoint character to this show is Kyon, an ordinary high school boy whose yes. life is, you know, pulled into the vortex of strange happenings. And he's yeah. endlessly monologuing. <laughs> yeah, Kyon is a very cynical and, like, laid-back guy. Like, Haruhi is just continually coming up with these bizarre random statements, and nothing, like, flusters him. Um like Haruhi just like wanders in one day and and declares that and we're going to like start a baseball team and he's like what mm -hmm. that's that's all the reaction he gets because i mean if you hang around with Haruhi for like any length of time she just randomly comes up with like all variety of just arbitrary and like obtuse things that they have to do right away because she has a very low threshold for boredom yeah and, and it's it's not just ADHD, it's kind of this existential boredom where she has, she had like this revelation at some point in her younger life that there were not just a lot of people in the world, but billions of people in the world. And that one human being didn't really count for anything unique or special. And up till that point, she had thought that she was unique and special and, you know, everything around her was, was uniquely cool and interesting. And then she found out that, no, she was just one of like a million other schoolgirls and everybody had parents and everybody's school did this, that and the other thing. And it, it really, I get the feeling like knocked her back a couple of pegs and, and initiated like sort of the, the situation that the whole series is about discovering and understanding and then hopefully resolving at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so through her power, she has sort of brought together certain people. She's, you know, she yeah. announced her first day, like when you introduce yourself, like I'm looking for aliens, time travelers and espers. And that's yep. what I'm doing. And she's just back down. And she's really disappointed when nobody in class cops to being a time traveler or esper or, or, an, alien. or an alien. And she just sort of looks around gets like really disappointed and angry and then sits down fed up so she's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no I was just going to say then her approach is to then recruit the people who seem to most fit the typical anime tropes yeah. so she grabs a moe girl mascot <laughs> from the who actually turns out to Was be from the, the higher grade yeah she's like a junior in the calligraphy club yeah. and, and Haruhi yeah. just like basically abducts mm. her yep <laughs> there's a quiet girl who's who's the only member left of the literature club who just sits alone in the literature room and so the, yeah so the, uh, Haruhi moves in takes over over the uh, the room and you know <laughs> declares her a member of the club, and then the the transfer student who shows up and you know well he's clearly he's clearly something he's he's a mysterious transfer student because well nobody transfers at this time in the semester <laughs> don't you think that's kind of mysterious a lot of sound <laughs> yeah I mean she's right she doesn't yeah. know she's right <laughs> yeah. but and, and that's the funny thing about this because she's she can like control reality on a subconscious or unconscious level. 
but she doesn't realize that she can do it. So if she's convinced that there must be time travelers, espers, and aliens around, these things show up, but they know about Haruhi, so they don't reveal themselves to her. So there are time travelers, aliens, and espers all observing Haruhi Suzumiya, and she doesn't know that they're there or who they really are, more specifically. And they happen to get to be part of her club. Yeah, and then because Haruhi is like grousing at Kyon one day about how none of the clubs in school suit her interests. Because one of the things Kyon says was she just joined every club in school to see if it was interesting to her. And like the longest of them lasted about a week, he said. So Haruhi is like griping to Kyon about how these clubs all suck. And Kyon says something about creativity and Haruhi interprets this as a a great idea that I'll just start my own club. Duh. It's so great, she does. It's a great moment when she says that to him. Like in the middle of class. Like she yeah. goes like this big rant and like, yeah, like she just, we're still in class. <laughs> Everyone's like looking at them. Yeah, she just like grabs Kion, yanks him backwards <laughs> on the chair onto her desktop and then goes, that's it! I'll start my own club! And he's like, I'm really glad for you. <laughs> and, and then you like, look at the entire room and like the teacher has stopped <laughs> teaching and everybody in class is just staring at Harui. And, and, and I have to say that the direction in this series is really spot on. And mm-hmm. I think one of the things that really helped catapult this series into popularity. I mean, the art style is very good, but they've but, uh, but Kyoto Animation has also put a lot of work into the way they frame scenes, the way mm-hmm. they do camera angles, uh, the way they do their cuts. Um, even the way they animate the motion. Like a lot of the times the, anim- the animation is your typical, you know, just sort of utility animation. But every once in a while they will actually like spend the budget to do like one quick sequence on ones like if somebody has like a wild reflex reaction or a gag really needs the the motion to be fast and smooth Mm -hmm. they will actually like do that for a couple of seconds and then go back to like normal animation so it, so it's also worth noting that this series is uh, famed for a couple of extended sequences like mm. that where they used rotoscoping, I think possibly to the best effect of any anime show mm. uh, as, as it feels uh, really naturally integrated. Uh, and that's, of course, the, the famous uh, concert scene, which right, comes right. at ah, the end. Okay, yeah. Uh, which, I, which is just, uh, I mean, at the time was kind of mind-blowing to see this, uh, you know, as a, as a weekly anime show, yeah, not that... as, uh, you know, a yearly movie or something. Yeah, this this series is actually like very technically sophisticated. Uh, like there's one episode where um, Haruhi decides they're going to make a student like Tokatsu film or something and they go to a lot of trouble to simulate like a handheld camera motion mm. and a bunch of other stuff that is very hard to do in animation. Yes. <laughs> um, so like Lord knows how much time they spent on that one episode. Mm-hmm. Well, we're talking about a lot of high points, but there are also some low points. For example, the Endless Eight. Well, uh, so that, that's second season. So so this may be a good time to talk sort of, we've sort of set the scene. So let's talk about the show's structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that I think also really helped this show, like from the get-go, was it was broadcast in a, in a non-chronological order. Yeah. So uh, sort of a Pulp Fiction-like, uh, you know, just mince everything up and put it together. Yeah, so you're you're watching or the in the original broadcast order, it just skips all over the the timeline and you're really I don't want to say at sea, but it really forces you to pay strict attention and watch for clues and figure out how it all how all the puzzle pieces fit together because the big revelations happened earlier chronologically but you as the first time viewer don't know what's happened so you know who's this new person who suddenly showed up you know what what's this you know this agreement they've already under, uh, reached clearly about what's actually going on yeah um so in that regard the, the, it was structured confusingly and the nice thing is, or the bad thing is, if you watch it on Crunchyroll, they have everything in sort of chronological order. So stuff happens over the course of a school year, say. So, and now the reason I believe that they made the choice to sort of do the, the mix and the, the, the swizzle stick with the chronology mm-hmm. was to give uh, the first season a strong arc. 
uh, because most of sort of the strongest action happens over the course of the first six episodes. And then after that, it becomes a bit more episodic. Mm. And by sort of spacing the revelations out throughout the season, uh, they sort of tease the mystery out through 12 or 13 episodes, whatever that that first run was. And so you get, you know, the actual uh, sort of emotional and... Uh, Climax, as well as the climax of the mystery happening, you know, at the end of the season, mm. which I think, uh, for me, definitely increased the the interest in the show. Uh, because when you start to see things together, I, or when you watch it sort of as just a strict progression, some of the uh, uh, some of the magic gets lost a little bit. I think mm, it feels okay. a little more like a conventional anime show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I watched the uh, originally watched it like years upon years ago when it came out, I watched it in the broadcast order, mm. and I think I preferred it that way because rewatching it for the screening, I felt like the first six episodes pretty just nicely handled everything, and then after that, yeah, I just like, watched. What are, we, what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, after that, what I watched was more just because well, do you have a few more episodes recommended? So I watched them, but it too nicely like fit everything together and also also sort of getting annoyed with the constant monologuing with Kion, which I think doesn't hold up as well for their screening, at least for me personally. So the monologuing is, so, so as, as Matt mentioned earlier, this is indeed a light novel adaptation. And I'll also bring up a little bit of that, and that I've been reading the fourth book. Ah, okay. Like years ago, like I got yeah. it, and I'm just now getting around since we're doing it to reading mm. it. I've only got about a third of the way through, mm. like 70 some pages. But, yeah, that's even worse than the book. <laughs> right. But that's their way, I think, of sort of trying to capture the voice of the book. So rather than simply adapt the events that are going on, they're trying to capture you know, sort of these very uh, strong character voices that drive uh, some of these light novels. Or the books are dealing with a clear first-person point of view, like the ring the book yes. from. But you can't really do first-person point of view with the uh, TV show slash movie. Um, or video type, whatever they're going to call it, medium. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not quite sure if that works as well or not. Mm. I mean, again, as you said, it's a large part of what the books are, just constantly hearing him like do his little spiels. But at the same time, or the book I also find very annoying, but I also find annoying the book because they don't quote when he's talking so half the time he's thinking and sometimes he's talking but not <laughs> right. quite sure yes. because not sometimes marked. people are reacting to and it's funny you say that because actually when they're not showing his mouth moving I did have interest in the anime where I was like he said out loud or is he monologuing right now in his head <laughs> yeah. it's funny yeah, you say that yeah and that. There's, there's a lot of things where he will just flow seamlessly from his internal monologue to speaking to somebody and a couple of times like other characters call him out on that where you think like well is he monologuing or is he just sort of muttering to himself and uh, if you can't see his mouth moving um, just sort of assume that he's like doing an interior monologue or soliloquy or something so after the first season uh, American fans at least were definitely in a froth over this show and there was much excitement when the second season was announced. Mm-hmm. And then the studio made some, shall we say, exceptionally dubious choices in how to approach the... Artistically. Uh, yes. Yeah. So there's, uh, in one of the books, there's a, a sequence where uh, Harui decides that, um, you know, th- th- our particular week is perfect. And so the... Uh, it it sort of it just gets replayed endlessly over and over, like Groundhog Day. Except, unlike Groundhog Day, nobody inside the uh, these repetitions actually knows it's being repeated. Wait, Kyo doesn't know. Oh, I thought, oh wow, I should have watched this one. I didn't know that. I assumed yeah. Kyo knows. knew throughout the whole thing. Well, like so, that would make more so, sense so to so me. The, and he's trying to make it so like let's make horror. He not repeat this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so this is endless eight, and so okay. they actually animated the exact same sequence of events with these just sort of minuscule differences and utterly lavish, you know, animation, <laughs> <laughs> totally different direction, but exactly the same things with just very slightly different wording eight Mm -hmm. times and at the time you know for people who were just you know excited for you know more more hurry this was like the worst waste possible (laughs) because they're just burning through animation budget Mm. and you know there's the frustration and the disappointment grows and grows and grows 
Um, yeah, so that was a, uh, and then the, they, they animated, I guess, the, the sigh of Harui Suzumiya, which is a bit that leads up to the, um, up to the uh, cultural festival stuff and the, and the making of the film. And that just is not an enjoyable sequence to watch either, as Harui is at her most sort of uh, misanthropic. Mm. And I've mentioned how, like, I find Kyung a bit annoying with his monologuing, mm. but another problem that I found rewatching this is Susan Mia is really annoying as well. Oh, so. yeah. She's, she's a piece of work for sure. Yeah. So oh, yeah. when the two main characters are kind of unpleasant to watch, I mean, like, the first time watching it, I didn't mind as much. But as I say, I also watched in the original broadcast tour, so there's more mystery. Yes. But watching it again and when having, like, the main bulk of like what's actually going on in the world explained in six episodes then it's yep. kind of like okay in i don't want to yeah i don't want to deal with you anymore it's like <laughs> type of i mean to the characters you know right, how it's right. like because like he's not quite as annoying but the esper characters he's not again annoying but he's i don't really particularly care for him mm -hmm. either he doesn't no, seem to have a very strong personality he's he's basically like i'm a transfer student and an esper and also some of the stuff with how um, the uh, time travel girl, but I uh, can't remember her name. Mikuru. Oh, uh, Asahina? Mikuru, Asahina. Asahina. Okay, Mikuru yeah. yeah. Mikuru. Like some of the stuff, how she gets treated was kind of disturbing as well. So, so definitely the uh, sort of sexual politics of this show are not particularly advanced and are not aging particularly yeah. well. There's a lot of the sexual harassment as mm -hmm. humor and comments by... And, the main character not as quite as much as his friends but definitely there uh that were sort of you know very much in every show at the time and are still quite present but mm -hmm. it, i mean this isn't as bad as say a uh, full metal panic which when you go back and watch it is just you know it's like you know this probably isn't the best <laughs> way to structure all of your humor uh -huh. it's just one of those things that doesn't age well i would agree with that yeah i mean i almost like the horror he interaction with her yeah, you know, she makes her dress up as a maid and a bunny girl, and then like kicks a her nurse. on top of the guy, the computer guys, and he can make black, you know, blackmail material to steal a computer. <laughs> like, yeah, that was a little weird to me. Yeah, <laughs> this and, time around. And Haruhi does this thing where um, she doesn't care what other people think. So when it's time to change clothes, she has no compunctions about just stripping down wherever she happens to be, and like changing into her gym uniform or a bunny girl outfit or whatever. And by the same token, now that she's got Mikuru to boss around, she doesn't see any reason why Mikuru should be modest or anything about, you know, changing clothes when, when Haruhi decides it's necessary to change clothes. And, and sort of this is why it's clear that the main character of this show is Kyon, not Harui. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is about Kyon and his harem, not <laughs> about not about Harui as a character and sort of her emotional progression. Mm. Because she's there to sort of... Uh, introduce excitement to interact with Kyon to be you know sort of uh, 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 controlled a bit by Kyon her, her wilder impulses need a man's hand to settle her down <laughs> uh, so yeah that that aspect of this show is not my favorite for sure mm. I, I, I guess because Asahina is such a timid character presented so timidly like it seems like she's really being taken advantage of by yeah. Harhi at times that's yeah. probably the, that's the main thing I don't like Harhi taking off her shirt in the middle of the classroom like that's her being super weird and eccentric that's her choice to do that yeah. you know and then you know, all the boys get kicked out by the other girls like what are you doing mm -hmm. but yeah that's the other stuff it's Asahina the Asahina stuff's the part where I was like eh yeah so, and, and the sad part about Asahina is that she really is like a cute nice person I mean yeah she's a time travel agent but you get the feeling that she was, like, recruited to be a time travel agent, like, when she was, like, maybe 12, given a real fast briefing, and then sort of, like, shoved down the timelines when she was 16 or 15 to, like, spy on Haruhi Suzumiya. We, we see her future self, and she's much more confident and yeah. not nearly as timid. Mm -hmm. Which I almost got a little confused if, like, Asahina, like, younger Asahina, if that was more of an act for Haruhi or not. Like, it wasn't very clear. Because when Haruhi wasn't around, she was, like, talking seriously to Kion, if she felt a little more confident to me. Well, so I, it's, 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 you know, I'm not sure. Well, I, I think she was spooked by Haruhi because the whole reason why these powerful organizations have sent observers yeah. is because Haruhi is quite possibly capable of destroying the world if she becomes emotionally disturbed enough. 
award. That's really what they're. Wh- uh, which, in fact, does happen as a result of Mikuru getting a little too friendly with Kyon at one point. Yeah, Haruhi starts getting jealous that Mikuru is paying too much attention to her chief minion. Mm-hmm. We really shouldn't like. Yeah. Split the difference or whatever. I mean, here he is essentially God, just not realizing it. What comes mm. to my mind is um, there's a 1982 PBS like interpretation of the Mysterious Stranger, Mark Twain's. Mm. Yeah, there are multiple versions of the Mysterious Stranger. This is just one of the uh, because he never actually finished it. But anyway, um, it was like this almost an hour and a half long, and you can actually find it on YouTube. I just say a quick search, like not officially, but I'm just saying it's really curious. Mm-hmm. That I really liked, where essentially it's about a printer's apprentice in sort of medieval type times. And there's this boy who mysteriously shows up and then he sort of like reveals himself to the boy, the apprentice, that he's an angel and all these miracles happen. But eventually, like the spoiling it, but the actual content's decent enough that I don't think it ruins it too much. It's that's actually the apprentice who's like, God, and it's the whole, um, all the world is a dream and mm-hmm. you're nothing but thoughts or whatever of getting the quotes mm-hmm. a bit off but of Mark Twain's whole thing and I mean this is essentially just an anime version of that yeah we live within the mind of God no no I also just mean like how he itself is the dreamer the personification of mm-hmm. the dreamer yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so and this series is also very much aware of the tropes I mean, this is, it, it is yeah. all about, I mean, the structure of the show is woven from tropes and then twisting them slightly, but nonetheless embracing them. Yeah, I mean, you've got science fiction with aliens, you've got time travel is its own genre so of science fiction, and that shows up, and then espers are their own thing, and then there's this whole idea that, that Haruhi's club is, is sort of like a supernatural detective agency. I mean, that's the ostensive purpose mm-hmm. of it. It's a, to seek out, you know, Mysteries. weird new per- supernatural things for Haruhi's entertainment. Mystery Zero, we may find them. <laughs> yeah, they, they, never, they never find them because Haruhi is sort of instigating all of the mysteries and the other, and the mysterious creatures are like desperately trying to mm-hmm. like keep Haruhi balanced on the edge of being entertained without destroying the world too much. Or some are. Like, there's internal conflicts because you do have, like, with the. I don't uh, re- remember what they call it. In the, the, the data overmind. Yeah, the data there are overmind. different mm-hmm. factions, or, or they describe thought them as integration entity. different mm-hmm. consciences within the thought integration entity. Yeah, and how one of them essentially decides to, like, try and mix things up and actually tries to kill Kion. Mm-hmm. So. It's like, that ought to get a rise out of Harhi. <laughs> then we'll see some real data changing. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So and and Kion is like, I don't think that's a good plan at all. <laughs> I guess my thing with this is I was watching and I was thinking like the the relationship between Kion and I guess the other characters and Harhi is very strange because like they're not are they really true like friends to Harhi per se because they're not telling her anything about like they're keeping like something very important about herself from them and they just kind of tries to keep her from being bored. It's it's a weird relationship I found while I was watching it the second time. Yeah. it wasn't until after the the band episode where like. Hari, I felt, really developed more as a character because she got mm-hmm. thanked by the other band members yeah. who were, like, filling in for them. Where she, that was the first time she felt, like, more human than this crazy centric girl, but, like, more like a normal, you know, sociable high school girl. And yeah. I found that be sort of the best moment of her development. Yeah. Uh, I wish yes. it was more of that in the show. That's so where I come yeah, from. Yeah, because that was, that was the very first moment where she did something, something cool and interesting, not just... Selfless. Yeah, that was, that was... Well, it kept her entertained, but it also did good for somebody else, and it sort of gave her that social reinforcement and genuine, you know, f- amity and friendship that, mm-hmm. you know, basically everybody around her in her entourage is sort of pretending to give her, but not really. And sort of willed around her by her will, unknowingly, uh-huh. you know, this, granted, I mean, she willed the band members to her, but in some way that felt more natural and mm-hmm. kind of, I wish there's more of that, actually. And it's good that where do they pre- where do they place that one in the order the broadcast? It's, it's pretty close to the end. I remember that too. It's very close to the end in the it's chronological like, uh, order as well. Twenty five, twenty six, twenty six. It's okay, okay. In the chronological when the broadcast is the first season, though. I thought at the end. Yeah, of the it's first the season. end of the first season. Okay, I'm pretty so sure it ended. The that's first a, probably the best place to put that. I'm glad that it's both. Yeah, because it gives you. I mean, that is like as you say, and I think rightly put your finger on. That's her one moment of actual character development mm-hmm. in this show, aside from the ones that happened off screen in the prequel in the prequel mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. That's also kind of a bad thing. I mean, you don't have that much actual development outside the mystery. Correct. Correct. Um, 
But there are a couple of like interesting standalone episodes. Like I don't think we mentioned it during recording, mm. but we've mentioned it a few times outside of recording. It's the one where they're trying to get the computer back and they're sort of in the okay. sci-fi space world. Thing. Oh yeah, uh, good for Artemis fans for sure. <laughs> <as> they observed. <laughs> and conversely, I didn't really, I didn't rewatch it, but from what I remember, I don't think I cared much for the whole mystery island arc. Yeah, that's not. I thought it potential, but then I didn't really like, pay off at the end. Yeah, um, so yeah, it, it falls kind of flat. Uh, should we, since we're just generally talking about, maybe mention the movie, the uh, disappearance? Yeah, so the the movie's interesting. It kind of falls in the middle of things chronologically, and they chose not to animate it. And it at the time seemed like it, that would have been the obvious thing to do with some of those idiotic Endless Eight <laughs> episodes. Mm. And actually, just one more comment on Endless Eight before we get to the movie, and that is. <laughs> If they had done a, da- a Groundhog's Day thing, it would have worked potentially better, mm. you know, if there had been any sort of building tension. But the only tension is in you expect something to happen and then nothing happens. <laughs> so it's more like they're trolling the audience. Yeah. Instead, of, yes, exactly. It felt very much like trolling, as opposed to you know, sort of the pressure building up inside in in the sort of the drama of the world itself. Uh, you um, don't feel it was just sort of a very subtle high-concept artistic idea that just didn't really take wing. Well, that, I think that basically was it. Yes, we're going to do exactly the same thing eight times. But with subtle yeah. subtle differences so the eight audience episodes. will realize like, that it's... <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it was interesting, but again, just such a waste and just utterly torturous from mm-hmm. a viewer's perspective because the episode actually wasn't that great. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how you even do it. Yeah. Any, any episode arc like that is really hard to do, I would think, if you keep that interesting. That's like a two-episode thing at most. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Or three episodes, but then you sort of show shorter and shorter, yeah, yeah, chopped yeah, up yeah. bits with the with the variations coming up, mm-hmm. leading to like the explosive, you know, cracking out of the of the closed loop. Mm. Uh, but yes, the movie. So one of the fan favorite characters is Yuki Nagato. If you if you have a uh, an emotionless girl in the show, <laughs> she is sure to become a fan favorite. Mm-hmm. And this is indeed what happened. And so Yuki gets her an, an entire movie to herself. Or again, these are based off of books, so it doesn't feel like it's just pandering. No, no, no. But it's kind of pandering. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it might be, have been pandering to the light novel readers originally. Uh, but the premise is that uh, Harui has disappeared from the world, and nobody knows. And like everything is slightly different, including the fact that Yuki Nagato is a real-life girl, not an android-alien human interface. Dun, dun, dun. And she gets to have an emotional arc of her own where there might be some romancy things happening. Ooh. Okay, it's only a movie, so don't really get that much of an opportunity. No, no, but it is also, I think if you, you look at the runtime, about the same as Endless 8. So it's just 162 her, minutes, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's quite a movie. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually wow, that's did, a long movie. It's a really long movie, and I did not rewatch it for this. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was intending to, but just did not have the time. Mm. Uh, I may go back and revisit it now. Um, is it available uh, translated? It is available translated. I'm pretty sure it is not on Crunchyroll, though, so I'm okay. not sure. It's probably a... So you'd probably have to buy it on disc. I would guess, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, I clearly, clearly, the collective says this is recommended, <laughs> uh, with a lot of caveats. With some caveats, if if you want to bail on the endless eight, watch one or two episodes and then like just... watch the first one or the last one. Yeah, and, like pick one in the middle. Just no so one you would. See. If, no if, one. If, the third, if you're feeling like you want to understand a tiny taste of the frustration. Yeah, and nobody will fault you for it. Um, I think not watching in the Crunchyroll order, but like first looking on Wikipedia, finding out the original broadcast order and actually watching yeah. it that way. So I would definitely uh, say that's the best way to watch it. I considered watching it chronologically this time. I think this is my fourth watch through of the series, and I just could not bring myself to watch chronologically because because for me it works so much better uh, in the in in the broadcast order. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the cute things is in the original uh, broadcast of uh, the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. At the end, where they have like you know, the the tease for the next episode, mm. they always made a point of having Haruhi give the chronological order and Kion give the broadcast order. Ah, uh, yeah. Because he'd say like, coming up is next episode three and. and or Haruhi would say, next is episode 24, and he's like, what? It's episode three. Yeah. 
or I enjoyed like it in that. Chronolog- I watched it, rewatched it in chronological order. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think maybe it's because it's my, my first time watching it through. Mm-hmm. So I think that because I it wasn't like, oh, now I know everything about Ari, <laughs> like right off the bat. It's like it's it, you're right. It's better to space out the, the, the intrigue and the mystery of mm-hmm. it. But if you already know it, it doesn't really it didn't really bother me too much. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for the, the Blu-rays do um, they do present in chronological order, but they do have like an insert in there. Like the back of the inserts is like, hey, want to watch it this way? Watch these episodes in this order. So there is a guide in there. You end up with a Blu-ray copy of it. So what do we? What else do we need to know about it? Well, the music's good, <laughs> I think. So uh, speaking of rotoscoping, the ending sequence of the first season is another one of the things that uh, fans really loved about it. Yeah. Yep, it's a fun little pair of pair. Actually, did they change the uh, the ending sequence for the uh, for the U.S. versions? Because I was watching it on Crunchyroll today, and they didn't have the complete dance in the end credits. They on the Blu-ray version, they also do that, but they have a, the special features like that full dance, like the okay. special TV ending they call it. So I don't know how they originally did it. But. Yeah, I can't remember. It's been a long time, of course, since. Yeah, the original. I wish I still had fan subs of that. Yeah. Could have been like one of those things where like one of the episodes had the full dance, and that's how everyone made the yeah. AMVs. Everyone mm-hmm. saw. All those things. Right, they also yeah. could have like clipped it together yeah. from bits and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Hari Hari Yuka is yeah. that. So. It is tr- a tremendously engaging and peppy song. Yes. I actually prefer the opening song. The opening, opening song is great too. too. Yeah. You be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so yeah, good opening and good closing, especially on the first uh, part of the series. I'll say for that band scene, I saw so many AMVs prior to seeing the actual scene mm-hmm. with yeah. right, hair yeah. singing so many different songs. <laughs> and then, like, but then the songs they sang were really great a- anyway. Like, mm-hmm. it didn't, like, they didn't taint my, like, you know, uh, it's not going to be singing the song I wanted to sing. It's going to be like, oh, wow, there's two really good songs. <laughs> no, that was that was some seriously solid music as yeah. well, I think. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that episode is absolutely a highlight. Yes. Uh, and I think it also works better if you've seen enough of the show. You don't necessarily need to watch the entire thing, but you need to have enough of the background mm-hmm. to, to build up to the emotional payoff that that show gives, I think. Yeah, yeah this is actually a, a school festival episode that, that is really 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 good Mm -hmm. yes yes i mean everybody has a school festival episode sort of like everybody has a beach episode and a beauty pageant episode um but this one actually like really needed to be at the school festival yeah the Mm -hmm. original gundam school festival episode was such a winner (laughs) (laughs) yeah gundam on send okay so uh, where, I mean, people can buy this on Blu-ray, on DVD. And it's also on Crunchyroll, at least the uh, TV series that we've been mainly talking about. As well been. as some of the spin-off series as well. Yeah, I, I tried watching a couple episodes of the super deformed uh, Haruhi thing that's also on Crunchyroll. And, I've heard of that. And I was just sort of like, yeah, I don't need to see any of these. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't need to see it, really. <laughs> I don't know that I've seen the whole thing either. It just uh, not, not, did not uh, do much for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, The ma- Melancholy of Harui Susamiya, it's on Crunchyroll for the most part, except I guess maybe not the movie, but you can get that still legally other ways. So, to check it out, you can visit oglink.com slash one new I O. Okay. Thank you, both us. Um, so I I guess I guess it's just time for us to to wrap up because we've talked about Hari a lot. Uh, for all the things we meant here, please visit our website www.tagegeneration.net or just ognetworks.tv, and then that's also how you can get a hold of of uh, Bryce's fanboy forecast and hear the show that he did just like a day ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. What are we going to do next week? Well, we have a pretty good idea, but you don't. You're just going to have to find out on Wednesday because that's when we podcast. For feedback, you can always hit us up at otaku.generation at gmail.com and tell us how wrong we are about Haruhi and how, <laughs> how everyone's opinion is crap. Yeah, um, I think we should do Harry as the topic for the next eight episodes. Yeah. Think, think about it. Think about it. It's high concept stuff. <laughs> yep, and uh, you can also hit us up on Skype if you want. Talk generation one word. Okay, so we have an appendage, and also do live. We have no clue about what to do next week. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> two we weeks from now, yes. Next week, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what is the appendage? As I said, microphone in between the sheets. Okay. This is an extremely favorable day, just perfect for romance. (laughs) With the microphone in between the sheets. And that's your otaku generation fortune to guide you through the upcoming week. All right, everyone. Have a good week. (laughs) See you next time. Bye-bye. It's the mic, the top, or the bomb. 
Yes, we should turn on the the recorder. That would help. We record these. What? <laughs> Wait, have online. you been recording these all this time? I can never trust you again, Alan. I'm keeping that. I'll probably put that at the end of the show. 